Our speaker for today was born in Italy on November 23, 1942. He was ordained priest on April 27, 1974. He became the spiritual director of Don Bosco Makati on July 1974. Then after three years, he was assigned at Don Bosco Mandaluyong, where he served as its director for eight years. In 1985, he was appointed as novice master in Don Bosco, Canlubang. In 1987, he became provincial superior for eight years before being assigned as director of the seminary in 1993. He stayed and served for a year in very help of Christians Paranaque before he was sent to Papua New Guinea in 1997. He was appointed bishop of Alutau from 2001 to 2010, he became delegate as coadjutor Archbishop of Rabaul in 2011 and served as Archbishop of Rabaul from 2012 until 2020. Archbishop Panfilo is known as the Island Bishop. In the two dioceses he took care of, namely Alotau and Rabaul, he visited served and assisted the faithful in many ways. He did his best to reach out to the natives by proclaiming the word of God, celebrating the sacraments, and building the Christian community. True to his motto, Duk in Altum, or set out into the deep, some of the provinces there are located in the deepest depths of the jungle and in the highest mountains. The people loved him because he was the only bishop who went to the remote areas where no other archbishop has gone before, not even politicians. The natives admired him because despite him already in his 70s, the rugged terrain did not stop him from visiting them. He truly left an indelible mark in the hearts of the people. Now presently retired, he stays at Don Bosco School of Theology as its resident professor, but his work continues in promoting the importance of taking care of the environment. Brothers and sisters, let us all welcome our speaker for today, Archbishop Francesco Panfil. All right. Okay, I, I would like to present uh, an overview of the uh, Laudato Si. Actually, uh, probably this should have been done at the beginning. And uh, later on, I, gave, I could have given the concrete uh, cases. Anyway, uh, there is, first of all, an overview of uh, the Laudato Si. And then we'll go uh, chapter by chapter. There are six chapters. An overview. <coughs> What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? This question is at the heart of Laudato Si, the new the encyclical on the care of the common home by Pope Francis. <clears throat> this question does not have to do with the environment alone and in isolation. The issue cannot be approached piecemeal. This leads us to ask ourselves about the meaning of existence and its values at the basis of social life. What is the purpose of our life in this world? What is the goal of our work and all our efforts? What need, what need does the earth have of us? So, unless we struggle with these deeper issues, says Pope Francis, I do not believe that our concern for ecology will, pre will produce significant results. The encyclicals uh, takes its name from the invocation of St. Francis of Assisi, Praise be to you, my Lord, in his canticle of the creatures. It reminds everyone that the earth, our common home, is like a sister with whom we share our life 
and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. People have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. <clears throat> now this earth, mistreated and abused, is lamenting. And it's grown joy in those of all the forsaken of the world. Pope Francis invites us to listen to them, urging each and every one, individuals, families, local communities, nations, and the international community to an ecological conversion in the expression of St. John Paul II. We are invited to change direction by taking on the beauty and responsibility of the task of caring for our common home. Happily, Pope Francis recognizes that there is a growing sensitivity to the environment and the need to protect nature, along with a growing concern, both genuine and distressing, for what is happening to our planet. A ray of hope flows through the entire encyclical, which gives a clear message. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. Certainly this is a message of hope. Men and women are still capable of intervening positively. All is not lost. Human beings, while ca capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing again what is good and making a new start. Pope Francis certainly addresses the Catholic faithful, quoting St. John Paul II, Christians in their turn realize that their responsibility within creation and their duty towards nature and, and the Creator are an essential part of their faith. <clears throat> Pope Francis proposes especially to enter into dialogue with all people about our common home. The dialogue runs throughout the text, and in chapter 5, it becomes the instrument for addressing and solving problems. <clears throat> From the beginning, Pope Francis recalls that other churches and Christian communities and other religions as well have also expressed deep concern and offer valuable reflection on the theme of ecology. Indeed, such contribution expressly come in starting with that of the beloved ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, extensively cited in paragraphs 8 and 9. At several points, the Pope thanks the protagonists of this effort, individuals as well as associations and institutions. He acknowledges that the reflection of numerous scientists philosophers, theologians, and civic groups all have enriched the Church's thinking on these questions. He invites everyone to recognize the rich contribution which the religions can make towards an integral ecology and the full development of humanity. The itinerary of the encyclical is mapped up in paragraph 15, and is divided into six chapters. It starts by presenting the current situation based on the best scientific finding available today. That is chapter one. Followed by a review of the bit of the Bible and Judeo-Christian tradition, chapter two. The root of the problem in technocracy and in an excessive and self-centeredness of human being are analyzed in chapter 3. The encyclical then proposes chapter 4 
an integral ecology which clearly respects its human and social dimension, inextricably linked to the environmental question. In this perspective, Pope Francis proposes in Chapter 5 to initiate an honest dialogue at every level of social, economic, and political life that builds transparent decision-making processes. Recalling that no project can be effective if it is not animated by a form and responsible conscience, chapter 6, ideas are put forth to aid growth in this direction at the educational, spiritual, ecclesial, political, and theological levels. The text ends with two beautiful prayers. One offered for sharing with everyone who believes in God, who is the all-powerful creator, and the other to those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, punctuated by the refrain, praise be to you, which opens and closes the encyclicals. Now, we can go to chapter by chapter, simply uh, a bit of a chapter one, what is happening to our common home? The first chapter presents the most recent scientific findings on the environment as a way to listen to the cry of creation, to become painfully aware, to dare to turn what is happening to the world into our own personal suffering, and thus to discover that each of us can do about it. It thus deals with several aspects of the present ecological crisis. And it is good to point out some very concrete, for example, pollution and climate change. Climate change is a global problem with serious implications, environmental, social, economic, political, and for the distribution of goods. It represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. If the climate is a common good, belonging to all and meant for all, the greatest impact of this change falls on the poorest. But many of those who possess more resources and economic and political power seem mostly to be concerned with masking the problems or concealing their symptoms. This is a very straight accusation. At the same time, our lack of response to these tragedies involving our brothers and sisters points to the loss of that sense of responsibility for our fellow men and women upon which all civil society is founded. Then, the issue of water. The Pope clearly states that access to safe, drinkable water is a basic and universal human right, since it is essential to human survival, and as such is a condition for the exercise of other human rights. To deprive the poor of access to water means to deny the right to life consistent with their inalienable dignity. Then, the loss of biodiversity. Each year, sees the disappearance of thousands of plant and animal species which we will never know, which our children will never see because they have been lost forever. They are not just any exploitable resource, but have a value in and of themselves. In this perspective, we must be grateful for the praiseworthy effort being made by scientists and engineers dedicated to finding solutions to man-made problems. But when human intervention is at the service of finance and consumerism, it is actually making our earth less rich and beautiful, even more limited and gray.
Then another problem, the decline in the quality of human life and the breakdown of society. In the framework of an ethics of international relationship, the encyclical indicates how a true ecological debt exists in the world, above all in the north with respect to the south, in the face of climate change, there are differentiated responsibilities, and that of development countries is greater. Aware of the profound differences over these issues, Pope Francis shows himself to be deeply affected by the weak responses in the face of the drama besetting many peoples and population. Even though positive examples are not lacking, a complacency and a cheerful recklessness prevail. An adequate culture is lacking, as is a willingness to challenge lifestyle, production and consumption, but fortunately efforts are being made to establish a legal frame which can set clear boundaries to ensure the protection of ecosystems. Then chapter 2, the gospel of creation. Like all encyclicals, they have a theological background. The fa to face uh, the problems illustrated in the previous chapter, chapter 1, Pope Francis selects biblical accounts, offering a comprehensive view that comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition and articulates the tremendous responsibility at humankind for creation, the intimate connection among all creatures, and the fact that the natural environment is a, collect a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity and the responsibility of everyone. In the Bible, the God who liberates and saves is the same God who created the universe. And these two the divine ways of acting are intimately and inseparably connected the story of creation is central for reflecting on the relationship between human beings and other creatures and on how sin breaks the equilibrium of all creation in its entirety. This account suggests that human life is grounded in this fundamental and closely intertwined relationship with God, with our neighbor, and with the, the, the earth itself. According to the Bible, these three vital relationships have been broken, both outwardly and within us. This rapture is a sin. For this, even if we Christians have at times incorrectly interpreted the scriptures, nowadays we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute dominion over other creatures. Human beings have the responsibility to till and keep the garden of the world. To till and keep. Knowing that the ultimate purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us and through us towards a common point of arrival, which is God. That the human being is not the master of the universe does not mean to put all living beings on the same level and to deprive human beings of their unique worth and the tremendous responsibility it entails. Nor does it imply a divinization of the earth which would prevent us from working on it and protecting it in its fragility. In this perspective, every act of cruelty towards any creature is contrary 
to human dignity. However, a sense of deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. What is needed is the awareness of a universal communion. All of us are called into being by the one Father. All of us are linked by unseen bonds and together form a kind of universal family, a sublime communion which fills us with a sacred affectionate and humble respect. The chapter, chapter 2 concludes with the heart of Christian revelation. The earthly Jesus, with his tangible and loving relationship with the world, is risen and glorious, and is present throughout creation by his universal lordship. Chapter 3, the title is The Human Roots of the Ecological Crisis. This chapter gives us, gives an analysis of the current situation, so as to consider not only its symptoms, but also its deepest causes. In a dialogue with philosophy, and the human sciences. Reflection on technology are an initial focus of the chapter. The great contribution of technologies to the improvement of living condition is acknowledged with gratitude. However, it gives those with the knowledge, and especially the economic resources, to use them an impressive dominance over the whole of human of humanity and the entire world. And so it is precisely the mentality of technocratic domination that leads to the destruction of nature and the exploitation of people, especially the most vulnerable populations. The technocratic paradigm also tends to dominate economics and political life, keeping us from recognizing that by itself the market cannot guarantee integral human development and social inclusion. Modernity has been marked by an excessive anthropocentrism. Human beings no longer recognize their right place with respect to the world and take on a self-centered position, focus exclusively on themselves and on their own power. This results in a use and throwaway logic that justify every type of waste. You know that it is Pope Francis that has been using the term the throwaway culture. Environmental or human that treats both the other and nature as simple objects and leads to a myriad of forms of domination. It is this mentality that leads to exploiting children, abandoning the elderly, forcing others into slavery, practicing human trafficking and throwing away unborn babies because they do not correspond to what the parents want or selling blood diamonds and the pelts of animals in danger of extinction, and over-evaluating the capacity of the market and regulate itself. This is also the mentality of the many mafias involved in, track, in drug trafficking and trafficking of organs. Of course, you realize that these are tremendous accusations and that create the problem. Therefore, it's not just ecology, it's also the human ecology. In this light, the encyclical addresses two crucial problems of today's world. Above all, any approach to an integral ecology, which by definition does not exclude human beings, needs to take account of the value of labor. 
because to stop investing in people in order to gain greater short-term financial gain is bad business for society. The second problem regards the limitation of scientific progress with clear reference to, uh, to GMOs. This is a complex environmental issue, even, through in, even though in some regions their use has brought about economic growth, which has helped to resolve problems, there remain a number of significant difficulties which should not be underestimated, starting from the productive land being concentrated in the hands of a few owners. Pope Francis thinks, thinks particularly of small producers and rural workers of biodiversity, of the net, network of ecosystem. Therefore, a broad responsibility scientific and social debate needs to take place, one capable of considering all the available information and of calling things by their name, starting from lines of independent interdisciplinary research. And then, chapter four is concentrated solely on integral ecology. The heart of the encyclical proposal is integral ecology as a new paradigm of justice, an ecology which respects our unique place as human beings in this world and our relationship to our surroundings. In fact, nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. This holds true in all fields, in economy and politics, in different cultural per cultures, particularly in those most threatened, and even in, in every moment of our daily lives. The integral perspective also brings the ecology of institution into play. If everything is related, then the health of a society's institutions affects the environment and the quality of human life. Every violation of solidarity and civic friendship harms the environment. With many concrete examples, Pope Francis confirms his thinking that the analysis of environmental problems cannot be separated from the analysis of human, family, work-related, and urban context, and of how individuals relate to themselves. We are not faced with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social. No, rather one complex crisis which is both social and environmental. Human ecology is inseparable from the notion of the common good, but is to be understood in a concrete way. In today's con context in which injustice abound and growing numbers of people are deprived of basic human rights, and considered, and considered expendable, committing oneself to the common good means to make choices in solidarity based on a preferential option for the poorest of our brothers and sisters. This is also the best way to have a sustainable world for future generations, <coughs> not just by proclaiming these truths, but also by committing to care for the poor of today. Benedict XVI already emphasized this clearly. In addition to, to a fairer sense of integrational solidarity, there is also an urgent moral need for a renewed sense of intergenerational solidarity. Integral ecology also involves 
everyday life. The encyclical gives specific attention to the urban environment. The human being has a great capacity for adaptation, and an admirable creativity and generosity is shown by persons and groups who respond to environmental limitations by alleviating the adverse effects of their surroundings and learning to live productively amid disorder and uncertainty. Nevertheless, a great deal of integral in improvement in the quality of human life, public space, housing, transport, etc., is still needed in order to achieve authentic development. Also, the acceptance the acceptance of our bodies as God's gift is vital for welcoming and accepting the entire world as a, give, as a gift from the Father in our common home. Whereas thinking that we enjoy absolute power over our own bodies turns often subtly into thinking that we enjoy absolute power over creation. Now we go to chapter 5 which uh, is very dear to me because, as I explained about my involvement in Pomio in, in Papua New Guinea, is concentrated in this chapter five, lines of approach and action. This chapter addresses the question of what can and, and must do. What we can and must do. Analyses are not enough. We need proposals for dialogue and action which would involve each of us individually, no less than international policies. They will help us to escape the spiral of self-destruction which currently engulfs us. For Pope Francis, it is imperative that practical proposals are not developed in an ideological, superficial, or reductionist way. For this, dialogue is essential. A term present in the title of every section of this chapter. There is a certain environmental issues where it is not easy to achieve a broad consensus. The Church does not presume to settle scientific questions or to replace politics. But, Pope says, I want to encourage an honest an open debate, so that particular interests or ideologies will not prejudice the common good. <clears throat> On this basis, Pope Francis is not afraid to judge international dynamics severely. Recent world summits on the environment have failed to live up to expectation because due to lack of political will, they were unable to reach truly meaningful and effective global agreements on the environment. And he asks, what would induce anyone at this stage to hold on to power only to be remembered for their inability to take action when it was urgent and necessary to do so? Instead, what is needed as Pope have repeated several times, starting with Pachem and Terris, are forms of and instruments of go global governance, an agreement of system and governance for the whole range of the so-called global commons. Seeing that environmental protection cannot be assured solely on the basis of financial calculation of cost and benefits. The environment is one of those goods that cannot be adequately safeguarded or promoted by market forces, citing the compendium of the social doctrine of the Church. In this fifth chapter, Pope Francis insists on development of honest and transparent decision-making processes in order to discern which policies and business initiatives can bring about genuine integral development. In particular, a proper environmental impact study of new business ventures 
and project demands transparent political processes involving a free exchange of views. On the other hand, the form of corruption which conceals the actual environmental impact of a given project in exchange for favors usually produce special, uh, usually produce special agreements which fail to inform adequately and do not allow for full debate. The most significant appeal is addressed to those who hold political office, calling them to avoid a mentality of efficacy and immediacy that is so prevalent today. But if they aren't courageous, they will attest to their God-given dignity and leave behind a testimony of selfless responsibility. And then the last chapter. The last chapter, the Pope calls for an ecological education and spirituality. The final chapter invites everyone to the heart of ecological conversion. The roots of the cultural crisis are deep and it is not easy to reshape habits and behavior. Education and training are the key challenges. Change is impossible without motivation and a process of education. All educational sectors are involved, primarily at school, in families, in the media, in catechesis, and elsewhere. The starting point is to aim for a new lifestyle, which also opens the possibility of bringing healthy pressure to bear on those who need political, economic, and social power. This is what happens when consumer choices are able to change the way businesses operate, forcing them to consider their environmental footprint and their patterns of production. The importance of environmental education cannot be overstated. It is able to affect actions and daily habits, the reduction of water consumption, the sorting of waste, and even turning off unnecessary lights. An integral ecology is also made up of simple daily gestures which break with the logic of violence, exploitation, and selfishness. Everything will be easier when starting with a contemplative outlook that comes from faith. As believers, we do not look at the world from without, but from within, conscious of the bonds with which the Father has linked us with all beings. By developing our individual God-given capacities, an ecological conversion can inspire us to greater creativity and enthusiasm. As proposed in the in Evangeli and in Evangeli Gaudium, at number 223 and 229, sobriety, when lived freely and consciously, is liberating. Just as happiness means knowing how to limit some needs which only diminish us and being open to the many different possibilities which life can offer. In this way, we must regain the conviction that we need one another that we have a shared responsibility for others and the world and that being good and decent are worth it. The saints accompany us on this journey. Of course, St. Francis, cited several times, is the example par excellence of care for the vulnerable and of integral ecology lived out joyfully and authentically. He is the model of the inseparable bond between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace.
The encyclical also mentioned Saint Benedict, Saint Therese of Lisieux, and let's call him now Saint Charles de Foucault, who will be canonized this coming Sunday, I think. Inspired by Laudato Si, the regular examination of conscience, a practice that the Church has always recommended to orient one's life in light of the relationship with the Lord. This ex regular examination of conscience should include a new dimension, the Pope says. One ought to reflect seriously on how one has lived in communion, not only with God, with others, and with oneself, but also with all creatures and with nature. That's all.